Welcome to RSP Film and Theory. He's Adam Harstead. I'm Matt Waldman. Um, you know, week three's in, on the way. Um, starts tonight. And we thought we'd have a good time talking a little bit about Adam's latest Dynasty and Theory piece. Um, we'll talk a little bit about some, kind of revisit something we talked about last week and use kind of maybe more concrete examples um, in terms of, you know, who you, players you might take a risk on versus players that you feel like are maybe... Um, you know, just kind of mediocre for, for your roster, depending on the setting and also depending on your view of the player. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about guys like Skylar Thompson, maybe any um, potential Rams receiver replacing Kua and Cup, um, and the Kua and Cup, and then also, you know, or something like backs not named Samaj P. Ryan, or maybe we want to name Samaj P. Ryan into that. So we'll talk a little bit about that. And, I saw last night, I kind of want to kick this off this way. I saw last night uh, a headline on the um, on my social media about Fran Tarkenter, Tarkenton. And they want to talk about Fran Tarkenton. And of course, they're going to put that he's 85 years old because they want to imply that he's a crusty old man who might be a little bit dealing with some sort of mental decline. Um, that's the way I took it. Maybe they didn't mean it that way. But they they did that and then quoted... Him saying, Patrick Mahomes really doesn't do anything that I that I could have done that I haven't al- that I haven't already done um, in terms of on the field, not like winning Super Bowls, but it, you know, just in terms of overall skills. And I looked down at the I, I want I looked down at the uh, you know reactions to that, and you could see that a lot of it was laughter. Um, and then I started thinking of you know I'd seen some of Fran Tarkenton. I've certainly watched enough of his videos. And I thought, does he have reason to feel a little crusty about this? And, you know, when you look at, like, his AV on, you know, pro, pro football reference, it's number 11 overall at, a, at an impressive 149. Mahomes is at 96, 191st overall. Um, we anticipate if Mahomes' career continues to be as it goes as it goes, that it will probably be up there with Fran Tarkenton's, if not um, surpass it. But number 11 overall isn't too shabby. And I just went back to watch some highlights of Fran Tarkenton, who did go to four Super Bowls, in an era where they beat the shit out of quarterbacks, where they held the shit out of wide receivers, um, and that, you know, head slaps and, you know, all sorts of things that are considered, like, below-the-belt football now these years was just completely above board and okay. And I... I watched him play and I watched a lot of his throws at him and I I wasn't quite laughing at that statement after I did. So I'm just wondering if you have a take on on it because I'll share I'll continue sharing mine from a film perspective, but you, you know, as kind of an intro to it, I kind of thought it's, it's not so funny. I could see why maybe he's a crusty old man if he is indeed that way. And and as someone he's a you know, he is born in Georgia. And as a UGA alum, we've tried at times, I remember working at the magazine, trying at times for us to get in touch with him to do interviews. And he really didn't like talking to people um, very much anymore. Um, and so, you know, I understand why maybe the athletic post, you know, framed it the way it was, though part of me wanted to say, Fran, we didn't need to know Fran Tarkenton, 85. 85 had nothing to do with what he had to say, but they wanted to, they wanted to put that in there to say he he's an old crotchety guy who who may his mind may be leaving him and I thought that was kind of shitty of of some of our journalism industry just from my perspective but anyway yeah uh, you didn't realize this when you proposed this topic that you were kind of stepping into a, a hornet's nest here because I got some thoughts on Fran Tarkenton okay cool um, I got I got a lot of thoughts yeah um, and I so I think. First and foremost, like it's important for the younglings out there that we put some respect on Franny's name here because, um, so he when he retired, he had the all time passing yardage record, uh, and it's been you know that record's been passed around. Marino took it from him, and then uh, Favre took it from Marino. Manning took it from Favre. Brady took it from Manning. Uh, and if you look at the history of the record, uh, Tarkenton held that record for the longest time. Nobody's held that record for as long as Tarkenton has since the beginning of passing stats. And not only that, he's the only player on that list who, when he retired, the guy who would eventually replace him wasn't even in the league yet. 
Uh, he retired in 78. Marino didn't enter the league for another half decade until 1983. Uh, and, and also it's important to remember that Tarkenton put up the bulk of these numbers in the 70s, which is known as the dead ball era for very good reason, because it was without question the hardest era in NFL history to pass the ball. It was the least efficient passing era. Um, and so despite all of those things working against him, and then, and then on top of that, um, you know I'm very big on entanglement, that like a lot of times how you perform, it's not just a function of you, it's a function of the situation you find yourself in. And Tarkenton was like the original entanglement buster. He got drafted by an expansion franchise, the Minnesota Vikings in their very first year, and they were bad. Um, and he played immediately at age 21. In fact, he was the only 21-year-old quarterback in league history to start at least 10 games until Drew Bledsoe did it in 1993, and then Bledsoe was the only guy in history to do it until Stafford did it in 2009. Um, so it's <laughs> extraordinarily rare for a guy that young to be thrown out to the Wolves. And not only was he thrown to the Wolves, he actually played pretty well. Like, in terms of adjusted yards per attempt, uh, which is yards per attempt with a bonus for touchdowns and a penalty for interceptions. He was league average as a 21-year-old rookie on an expansion franchise. Um, this overrates him a little bit because he took a lot of sacks and adjusted yards per attempt doesn't account for sacks. But like, in terms of a guy being thrown into, like he was basically, it's like Derek Carr. If Derek Carr came out and looked like a functional starting quarterback from day one, that was Fran Tarkenton. And then um, he, he went from the Minnesota Vikings to a New York Giants team that had been good, but then um, YA Tiffle retired and their offense fell into a pit. And so they got Tarkenton and Tarkenton immediately turned their offense around just overnight. Same personnel except for Tarkenton took them from like a bottom five to a top five offense, which, you know, it's like a 14 team league. So that's not as big of a jump as it would be today, but he just made that offense credible overnight. But also, um, also when you have a 14 team league, the, the level of player has to be better to be on the team right. to, to, to actually start compared to True. 30 teams now. Yeah. Right. We can't yeah. find more than 20 good starters at best. Right. Um, and and so he, he immediately made the offense credible. They remained credible his entire time there. Uh, went back to Minnesota because the Vikings had built a team, like built like a dominant, dominant, all-time great defense. Um, but their offense had sucked since Tarkenton left. So they got Tarkenton back. Um, and he turned them into one of the best teams of the 70s. They never won a championship, so they tend to get overshadowed. But in term, I, I believe they have, like, the best winning percentage from 1968 to, like, 1978 over the Cowboys, over the Steelers. Um, they made four championship games. Um, they and, and it was Tarkenton. He turned that offense around. Um, Tarkenton was amazing. The comp I always like is John Elway. He played very similarly to John Elway. Um, I think he tended to be a little bit more like creative than Elway. Like both of them were very improvisational, but Elway, when he would improvise, it's not like he's doing the most creative thing. He's just doing, he's like such a better athlete than everyone else that he's doing things that only he could do. Whereas Tarkenton wasn't quite there where like, if anybody else makes this, they're wrong. Um, but because he's so elite, he can turn a wrong answer into a right answer. But he, he was more like Mahomes just in terms of like the creativity um, when he's off script and off schedule. So is there anything that Patrick Mahomes does that Fran Tarkenton could not or did not also do? No, could not do. No, Tarkenton absolutely could do everything Mahomes did. Is there anything Mahomes does that Fran Tarkenton did not do? Yes, absolutely. And this is the major difference between Fran Tarkenton and Patrick Mahomes. And I think if you watch a lot of highlight reels of Fran Tarkenton, you're going to get a very biased perception of him um, because he um, could not stay in structure and he did not stay in structure. Um, you know, Mahomes can operate an offense within structure. And then when the play goes to hell, he can bail on that structure and he can make something happen. Whereas Tarkenton basically only ever operated out of structure. He did his thing, and that's why he's changing teams. He was driving coaches nuts, um, and and it worked, but it was not as good as it could have been if he had been more disciplined, more willing to stay with the design of the offense. Um, I mentioned he took a lot of sacks, and and partly, yeah, the, the expansion Minnesota Vikings were a not great team, but this is on Tarkenton, too. He has the all-time career record for sacks taken and sacks yards lost. Uh, his first four seasons uh, still rank, three of them are in the top 10 all time in yards lost on sacks. 
And the fourth one is 20th, but he only started 10 out of 14 games that year. And these are 14 game seasons. So he lost a ton of yards on sacks, uh, put his offense in a very deep hole. And, and the most notable thing is none of those seasons rank in the top 100 all time in terms of number of sacks taken. Like the average yards lost on one of his sacks was like 10. It was crazy. He's, he's getting sacked. He's, he's trying to extend a play. He's hanging in there and it works often enough that he was worth the risk, but it failed often enough that like offenses just found themselves in a hole that they couldn't dig themselves out of. Uh, so I do think that like had Tarkenton had the discipline that Mahomes had, he would have been like the, the original Mahomes. But but Mahomes' brilliance isn't that he has this, this, this improvisational ability. That's what makes him so fun to watch. But what makes him so unique in terms of NFL history is that he, he has that improvisational ability, but he's not relying on it to the extent that a lot of the guys like Elway and Tarkenton were, or especially early career Elway, later career Elway tended to operate more within structure. Um, but, you know, Mahomes is, has one of the lowest of sack rates in the NFL. His average yards lost on sacks, the lowest in the NFL. Um, when he scrambles, he picks his spots. He's got one of the highest success rates in terms of like converting um, or gaining a, a substantial chunk of yards per scramble attempt. Um, I would say I think he's the most dangerous Russian quarterback in the NFL because, you know, Lamar Jackson does it more often. But like when Mahomes breaks the pocket and starts running, he's getting what he needs. Like 80% of the time, he's going to get what he needs. Uh, so, yeah, I think Tarkinson's absolutely right that that he he's rarely mentioned in like the top 10 all-time quarterbacks. He deserves to be. Uh, I think he's got a solid case for top five overall. Um, a couple of years ago, I probably would have had him in my top five. In more recent years, I've kind of reevaluated and revised, and he's moved down towards the bottom half of that top ten. But he is an all-time great quarterback. He deserves um, the recognition and the respect. Um, I don't think that Mahomes is necessarily the comp. Like, the modern Fran Tarkenton is not Patrick Mahomes. Um, no, you know, he's Frank more Harkenton Kyler. More of like a, Kyler Murray. Yeah, Kyler Murray. Yeah, I, I think that's a great comp. He's better than Kyler was, yep. especially as a passer. Absolutely yeah. better. But just in terms of like inclinations and tendencies, I think that's a great comp. Or like um, early career, like Dan Reeves era, John Elway, I think would be another. Um, and, and, and in that one, Elway was breaking structure so much because he hated the structure. Yeah. Right. He, he felt that the structure was like handcuffs and he was like, <laughs> screw this. I'm not going to stay with this design when like this is this is just holding me back and then once he got a structure he liked he could stay within it um whereas tarkenton jumped from team to team to team and he had he was so great that he made every team he was on better but also um his limitations as a player are partly to blame for why they never got over that final hump yeah it's an it's a great topic because you know going back to watch him things that i noticed that you know he could he could layer throws between defenders he he certainly saw the field he really saw the field well he made a lot of throws on the move that that were you know across the field he had a good arm i mean he could throw the ball on a line at about 50 55 yards um and that's more than and i'm talking like not just on the same side of the field he could throw it from the opposite hash and find and find receivers in stride against tight coverage that were literally dimes that he was throwing. Um, I I saw enough, you know. I I I I have. To, I'm going to just agree with your point because I haven't revisited any games in complete, you know, completely with him. But I did see enough in some of the highlights that said, okay, here he is working from the pocket with you know with pressure bearing down, and he's he's standing in there to make the throw, and he's he's threading the needle with you know, into coverage. And I saw that plenty of times on highlights, but I could see where the forays that he had with coaches probably drove coaches crazy. But I also wonder, I would raise a question, how much of that is the authoritarian attitude of coaches from who were raised in the 40s, 50s, and 60s doing this, as opposed to a coach from today's era who maybe would appreciate more of this stuff? Because Dan Reeves certainly didn't like Elway doing all that stuff unless they absolutely needed to um, at the very well, end. It's funny because um, Tarkenton's first head coach was Norm Van Brocklin. 
the Dutchman. Um, who was like, yeah, yeah, he, he's he was. So the thing with Norm Van Brocklin is he wanted to be a coach. Even when he was a quarterback, he wanted right. to be a coach. He was with the Rams. He left the Rams. He went to the Eagles. Um, and somebody asked him, you know, why did you leave the Rams? Um, and he, like the Rams coach was Sid Gilman. And Norm said, because I um, wanted to coach the team. And Sid wouldn't let me. Right. Uh, so he went to the Eagles. And the Eagles had um, a coach named um, uh, Shaw, uh, Buddy Shaw, Buck Shaw. I forget. I Buck Shaw, Buddy. I think. Okay. Buddy Shaw, one of the Shaws. I forget now. Um, but uh, he had been a former coach. He had retired. Um, he kind of didn't want to do the grind anymore. And the Eagles are like, well, just come back and like just coach during the seasons. You can have the off seasons off. That's totally fine. Um, and Norm's like, actually, yeah, that's preferable. Like, I'll do all the stuff during the off season. You don't need to worry about that, right? You don't need to worry about the offense. I'll do the offense. That's fine. It's not an issue. Um, and uh, he won a championship with Shaw and the Eagles in 1960, won league MVP that year. And then Shaw retired and Norm felt that he had a handshake deal to take over as head coach and the Eagles um, hired someone else instead. And so Norm said, that's fine. That's great. I retire. He joined the Minnesota Vikings as their head coach. He's the first, he's like the last player to go directly from player directly to head coach. Don't, don't do any steps in between. You're just a player and then you're a head coach. Yeah, don't um, go. And so, yeah, so that was Norm. And 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 Van Brocklin, like, that was his philosophy. Is that like, That's the quarterback's job. And I'm sure he told Tarkenton, like, that's what you do. Like, I don't care what your coach says. I'm your coach, and I'm telling you to do this. But you're the guy on the field. Like, you call the shots. Um, and it that, there was very much, like, that That was kind of a thing in the era. Um, Johnny Unitas said that you haven't arrived as a quarterback until you can tell your coach to go to hell. Right. Um and so that was that was the thing. I, I think a lot of Tarkenton's habits um, were probably coached into him by Van Brocklin, who who wanted a quarterback like he was. Um, and I'm sure it drove Van Brocklin. So like to Van Brocklin, that's how quarterback was played. Like that's what it was supposed to be. Uh, yeah, I, I do think I don't know if today's coaches would necessarily it, it just depends so much on coach. Like, yeah. could you imagine Sean McVay getting Fran Tarkenton? And, you know, like Sean McVay, you always say he wants to be the guy on the sideline with the controller, yeah, like no. doing the joysticks. And no, he, he'd have he poured water like on the controller. Yeah, he thought he'd pour broken. like he yeah, he thought he poured Coke on it or something and it's sticky. Yeah. You know, and it keeps going uh, around in circles, you know, so I hear but there you. are other coaches, too, you know, yeah. like like Tony Dungy. Um, he, he totally yeah. would have just been like, Hey, Norm, like I'm not, or Hey, um, Hey Fran, I'm not here to like change who you are. You do yeah. your thing. I think Andy that's great. Reed would have been fine with sure. it. Sure. Absolutely. Know? Like yeah. I'll Pete do Carroll what I do would have been around fine what with you it. do. Yeah. Pete Carroll absolutely would have, uh, Harbaugh, yeah. um, Jim Harbaugh, welcome back to the NFL. He, yeah. he would have loved it. Tomlin. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. It's just, it's all the, it's all the heavy West coast influence guys who want who really are very hands-on and micromanaging about their offenses that would have a tough time with this but you're absolutely right and i just think you know you watch him and then of course you did call your pl own plays you made your own adjustments you know this is like you know that's a revelation nowadays if anybody does anything like that to even like a fraction of the degree of what they actually did you, you know in in the game in the 70s in the 60s and 70s so i mean yeah watching them the layered throws the movement um the arm um the imagination the back shoulder throws that he would make that you go oh that looks like something aaron Rodgers did that everybody would like to give credit to aaron for for really you know doing you know, doing now that's been around for a while um fran was doing it repeatedly um so there's a part of me that i can see why at 85 years old the athletic because you know we got to put that in there that uh that he might be a little sore at the idea that like Patrick Mahomes isn't some revelation in football. Um, it's just that it's been a while that we've seen a player with the combination of skills like that. But I would agree, you know, based I'm, you know, you if you've watched him Tarkenton recently, and also the history of what we've seen, you know, if we're gonna base it on from your point of view, which I think is worthwhile, then yeah, Patrick Mahomes is better in structure, and I think that that's probably the the important thing there. I'd also say that, you know, we could talk about that whole athletic differences, but that goes down a rabbit hole that really is just not fair because if Patrick Mahomes were born in Fran Tarkenton's time, he would he would probably be a comparable athlete, you know, based on nutrition, based on the type of exercise science that was out there, 
all that kind of thing. If Fran Tarkenton were born into this era, it, it vice versa, you know? So yeah. it's, it, you know, I think you got to, all I would just say is that it's tougher. The, the, it, it was tougher to play in that era for a number of reasons in terms of what, what I broached in the beginning. So yeah, when, if you see that article or if you see people making fun of it, um, just understand that maybe they don't know, haven't seen Fran Tarkin in play. They may not understand the history of what he did. Um, and you know, and they've been suckered in by the, they've been suckered in by the kind of the, the little, um, manipulative details of the headline um and that's just how i put it shame on you guys for i also doing think that. i always wonder too if his name like works against him you know like quarterbacks are supposed to have names like norm and tom and terry and john yeah. and, um you know i don't know pat man, what kind of pa- patrick i mean you know i think of you know castle under the sea you know but i mean you yeah. know but that's i don't i don't know but but you know, yeah, maybe it does, or maybe it's that, that he was just a, you know, six feet one, you know, six feet two hundred maybe or one ninety, yeah. and yeah. was he really six feet, or did they amp that up, you know? Because I'm sure they they were amping that up probably in the beginning too. So and he started in the AFL too, and there was a lot of bias in that era where like. I wouldn't even say bias. I think like snobbery. It kind of took a while for the AL to kind of gain that sort of yeah. acceptance. And so like, oh yeah, Fran's great. But you know, uh, it helped when he went to the Giants and like, oh, he's doing it in the NFL too. And yeah, now it counts all of a sudden. But but yeah, yeah. Um, he's he. It's similar to Marty Schottenheimer, where when you're really really good for a really long time, but you don't have any titles to show for it, people act like that doesn't count. Yeah. Um, but he was legitimately one of the greatest quarterbacks to ever play. Yeah, without a doubt. And and there were a lot of things I saw on tape last night, you know, when I watched it, I was going, Okay. Yeah, I I'm glad I I'm glad I wanted to look because I there's a part of me that wanted to laugh when I saw it. And then right. I realized I was being manipulated. And so then I, I looked at it from with my own eyes. I was like, oh, fuck no. I can see why he's a little crusty about this shit. So, um, so He yeah. might be crusty, but he's earned the right to talk. He, 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 he talk. has. Absolutely. I mean, to have held that record 14 games, 14 games a season, and to have held that passing yardage record for that long, you, you know, until someone overtook him in that rougher era of the league, um, and doing the imaginative stuff that he did that. Yeah, it is. It's kind of a mixture of like Kyler Murray, Russell Wilson, John Elway, um, and Patrick Mahomes. Like he's kind of, he's kind of the mixture of all those guys. And he is the grandfather of the, you know, of like the chef versus the baker. He was, he was probably the, the, the guy on the chef scale, you know, like way off on that spectrum more than anybody else had been that chef. Um, yeah. I don't know you about know. that. I mean, I, it's, yeah. it's, you know, like we want to, for, from today's perspective, we want to give the old guys credit, but even from like Tarkenton's perspective, you got to go back further and you got to credit guys like Bobby Lane and Detroit. Sure. And there were, there's always been Luckman and Bob. I mean, like yeah. other than the 1920s, there was always a guy who was the guy before the guy. Yeah. True. True. So, you know, but I mean, I, I'd, I'd say from the wild flights of like, I'm just saying from the, like the wild flights of, running around and, and taking that much time the things that we see kyler murray do that people get awestruck you by. should uh you should watch some bobby lane sometime i think you'd find, yeah i think, I think he was a trip I, I need to go revisit him because i you know i mean i know he is and I've, I've certainly seen highlights in the past but you're right i probably need to go check that out again and see how he was in that regard i laughed because the other day I, w- I made a comp that anthony richardson for some in a lot of ways reminds me of Otto Graham. Like in terms of just style of play, um, and and that and it was funny because I didn't think I think most people wouldn't have said anything about that, but I got a lot of commentary about that from people who were like, "Yeah, you know," and like and and I was just shocked that people weren't like, "Who?" or you know, now nah, I got to go back and look or all of that. So anyway, yeah. Which and just as a 
small point. Uh, Otto Graham held the um, all-time pro football record for rushing touchdowns by a quarterback until Steve Young broke it in the 90s. He rushed for like 50 touchdowns in his career. Um, he wasn't getting like the huge British rushing yardage, but yeah, he was absolutely, you know, like an athlete athlete. Like he played professional basketball and yeah. Yeah. And I mean, he was as big as some of the linemen, you know, that he played with. So, it, you know, in some ways you're seeing it's, it's, there's some similarities there on that end. So let's talk about your, your latest feature in dynasty and theory, um, you know, and, you know, give us some practical applications of, of what you were talking about. Yeah, so I've um I always like I say I always like like reasoning from first principles where I feel like there's a lot of questions where um you might not have the data to come up with a solution, or you might not have the tools to come up with a solution, but if you just like think about it really carefully, and I'm not saying it's easy, but if you think very carefully and you think, you know, okay, well here's what I think and here's where that might be wrong and here's and you go through all of the the steps, you can get a pretty good answer. Um and um you know, I gave some examples of like, like here's in history, here's some questions that I didn't have the data to answer at the time. And so I just thought very carefully and gave my best guess. And then years down the road, we had the data and it confirmed that like, yeah, actually that was right. Um, and um, one of them was, there's this finding that um, teams don't outperform average in the NFL draft over a long timeline. You know, everybody does about as good. Like nobody's better at drafting than anyone else. They just get lucky for little streaks. Um, but you couldn't so so when a player goes like tenth overall, the the safest assumption is he's about as good as every other tenth overall pick. Um, but the one problem with that is like it only takes one team to reach on a player, but it takes all thirty two teams working in concert for a player to fall past his his expectation. Um, so one theory was that like when a team reaches on a player, that doesn't necessarily mean he's as good as the pick. But when a player falls, that does mean he's as good as the pick. And and at the time, like we didn't even have a way to define reach and fall. We didn't have any consensus big board or anything. Um, so I said, you know, for practical purposes, it's probably best to just treat every player as if they're as good as the pick. Um, but in theory, like it's entirely possible that that players who fall past expectation, that doesn't mean anything. That doesn't mean we should expect them to be better. But players who are reaches, yes, they probably will underperform. Um, and then like eight years later, we had the data. Somebody actually looked at it and found that that was true. Um, so I, I like when possible, that's what I like is I like to just think carefully about something um, because it's not necessarily easy, but it's a lot less work than like gathering the data and testing it and whatnot. Uh, and one of my favorite games, one of my favorite just like toy models to play with is like how valuable is a single regular season week in fantasy football right like if you have your team and then you take away your star player for one week in the regular season how does this impact your title odds um and then how does that compare to like all right you have the same team and you take away your star player for one week in the postseason how does that impact your title odds and i've done like three or four different like toy models or, or ways of just like thinking carefully about this to get an answer um and uh, it's fun, and I play with it, and, and and eventually I'm like, okay, well, I've I've like thought about this enough. It's time to actually like do the work and and figure out the answer. Um, so I looked up like the historical playoff rates uh, in fantasy football, meaning like if you're in a 12 team league where six teams make the playoffs and you finish seven and seven, what are the odds that your team makes the playoff? You know, if you finish eight and six, what are the odds you make the playoff? What are the odds you earn a buy? If you finish nine and five, on and on. Um, so I finally got the playoff rates, which let me model, um, like actually model, um, like what it would look like to, like if you get one guaranteed win in the regular season, how does that impact your championship odds? Um, and so then after finally modeling that, I'm like, okay, well now we know the answer. Um, previously I'd estimated that um, like, one guaranteed win during the regular season would increase your title odds by about one to 2%. So in a 12 team league, everybody has a one in 12 chance of winning it. Um, if you knew that like, Hey, this team's going to get a guaranteed win in week six, maybe their odds would be between nine and 10% rather than around 8%. Um, and then when I ran the model, I found that like, actually, yeah, that was, that was right. Um, but it wound up being on the high end of that spectrum. It actually wound up being 10%. Um, and mostly it's just because 
with the margins so thin, that one win actually significantly impacts your chances of getting a buy. Um, and a buy is like an automatic win in the playoffs. It's it's incredibly valuable. Um, so that was kind of cool to finally see that like, yeah, all of my estimates were pretty good, but also learn that like, okay, but it's 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 on the high end of the estimates. Like I thought it could plausibly be as low as this in value, but it actually wound up being at the at the very upper end of the estimates. Well, that's very cool. So, you know, from that standpoint, you know, how would you, you know, what are some things that you would look at from like, you know, how would I, how would I phrase like from a practical standpoint for, for fantasy players, something that they could apply to that, that could apply to. So what I've always used this for is when we know a guy is going to miss some weeks in the regular season. Uh, so like a, a fantasy player normally is going to play, um, 16 games a year for fantasy football because most leagues aren't playing in week 18. So if a player is going to miss four games at the beginning of the year, that's 25% of their games that they're going to be gone. But that doesn't mean that they lose 25% of their value because the games that they're missing are lower value than the games that they're still there for. Uh, and similarly, if a guy is going to play the first 12 games of the season, but then miss the last four, they lose much, much more than 25% of their value. You know, they're going to contribute a lot towards making the playoffs and earning a buy, but actually posting a win in those playoff weeks is, is critical. You know, if you have the lowest score in any of those playoff weeks, it is impossible to win a championship. There's just no route you can take to that title. Um, so that's what I've, I've traditionally used this for, especially if like there's a player who's suspended at the start of the season. You can say, like, where would he be going if he wasn't suspended? And then, okay, let's, let's estimate, okay, let's say he lost 15% of his value. What pick would be 15% less valuable than that pick? Maybe that's where he should be going now. Um, so that's what I've traditionally used it for. One of my motivations for actually building a model and calculating this more precisely is that um, we can look because part of the problem is that this is kind of just a, a generic estimate for a generic team with a 50 percent win rate in any given week but the reality is that like your team's not going to have this perfect 50 percent win rate in expectation your team's either going to be above average or below average and depending on how good your team is it actually changes the math um, if your team it has like a 90 percent win rate in expectation you know this the ex missing a game in the regular season, it doesn't matter. You're you're almost certainly getting that buy no matter what. Um, so great, go ahead and let that guy miss the game in the regular season. It costs you virtually nothing. Um, whereas if you only have like a 30% win rate in expectation, having a player miss even a single game often will be the difference between having any shot at all at the playoffs um, and having no shot at all. Uh, so I wanted to build the model so I can actually look at, you know, like these are the situations in which dynasty players tend to make win now trades where they're trading long-term assets for some short-term boost um, but we can actually calculate like when is the optimal time um, and I'm gonna uh, I'll have that this week that's what we're gonna be looking at like should you be more likely to make a win now trade when you have like a juggernaut who's already secured the buy should you be more likely to make a win now trade when you're like fighting for that last playoff spot like when is the optimal time <coughs> to make it um, and, and so that's, I think, what I'm really looking forward to dig more into. I actually gave um, some homework at the end of my column because, like I said, it, a lot of these things, if you just think carefully enough, you can kind of get to the solution without any of the data gathering. Um, so I gave, like, some questions to, to consider, like, what do you think the answer to these questions is going to be? And let's find out next week. Okay, very cool. All right, so let's revisit something that we um, broached last week or in the past couple weeks, and I think it was about, you know, sometimes it's better to take a player and ha leave a clear hole in your roster um, than to just not take a chance on a player and pick kind of a meh player who, who may fit the qualifications of filling a hole in any given week, but you really haven't solved the problem. Um, and I think that there's, an, you know, maybe a, a, an example of that because I saw in this week's roundtable, I brought up the three quarterbacks who are replacing starters due to injury or benchings this week. And they were, you know, Malik Willis, Andy Dalton, and Skylar Thompson. 
And when you look at Skylar Thompson, you obviously look at the, the Dolphins' offense and see the, the ceiling of upside with the surrounding talent there. Um, but at the same time, you know, Thompson was a rookie when he got extended playing time. They really compressed the the playbook to make it very basic and didn't give him an opportunity to really um, to, to really expand it and let him to be super aggressive. And when and on top of it, he probably wasn't ready for an extended playbook based on what we saw. Um, but there were moments with him that you know, I, there was definitely things I saw from him in college that felt like with development, he could become, there's a possibility that he could become, um, I would say a, a possibility um, or maybe enhanced odds beyond what I think a lot of people would see with a, a normal six round quarterback, where I think that he could emerge as a, as an, um, an annual starter on a team and be a good NFL starter. And, uh, you know, I saw that, you know, I saw a lot of drop passes his first season. Um, and I saw some things where his team didn't help him out. And some of that might be that he was a righty compared to them working with two as a lefty. I know that the 49ers used to have to adjust when Steve Young came in after years of being with Montana. Um, drop passes can can be occur how the offense runs plays to what side of the field how you know the importance of you know the backside tackle and whether you know you know it's different with a lefty and a righty so there's you know there's some there's some underrated things that could be a little bit different there and I'm thinking that two years later it feels like from their standpoint that they're saying all the right things, that, you know, before Tua got hurt, saying, you know, he beat out Mike White pretty, you know, hands down. The team feels like they can trust him with the playbook, that he understands the game better than what he did when he was a rookie, and we feel like that we could win with him. And when they brought in Tyler Huntley, you know, certainly I think they left it open in a way that people are going to take it in one of two directions. If you if you're the if you're part of the Tyler Huntley tribe on this one, you're going to say, well, he did, you know, Mike McDaniel said that he's open to letting competition take its place, but he's just giving his flowers to Skylar Thompson because he's there. He's got to use Thompson right now, but they're going to, you know, they're going to go with Huntley. And I think that's a little conspiratorial. I would probably say it's more likely that just like Kyle Shanahan, He's open to there being competition for that role, but the first guy who's earned it is Skylar Thompson. And that, you know, that this doesn't, at this point, this has nothing to do with, you know, bringing Tyler Huntley in has nothing to do with their lack of confidence in Skylar Thompson. It has to do with the fact that they need a quarterback to back up Thompson now that Thompson is the man. And they wanted to find someone with starter experience doing that, and he was the best possible ad that they could get off off the waiver wire so to give that as kind of background on my thoughts on Thompson I you know I look at him as a high ceiling low floor prospect you know he's he's quite volatile he could either be one of the great I mean just from my scouting he could he could be one of the great anomalies we've had since Tom Brady in terms of like scouting I'm not saying he's going to be Tom Brady but I'm just saying he could be one of those great an anomalies where we look at Tom Brady, Kurt Warner, Brock Purdy, you know, and go, these are guys that came from the late rounds and now they've made a career as a starter and two ends up retiring. And, you know, even though he says he doesn't want to at this point, and they'd look at it and say, we're operating well with Thompson. He's got a better arm than Tua. He's as mobile as Tua. I think he, when he's, when he's, Feel, he understands an offense that he's working in. He's a better pocket player than Tua is. Um, you know, so if all that works out, that could happen. At the same time, maybe he never has. He's never able to acclimate fully to the next level. Maybe the team doesn't fully trust him on the level to to run the offense, and he doesn't get the opportunity, or he doesn't make the best of his opportunity, and he completely flops. But to me, that means that's the guy I want to take right now. In like a dynasty league at the end of my waiver wire or on redraft compared to say the Rams receivers, Jordan Whittington, Demarcus Robinson, 
um, you know, Tutu Atwell or Quintez Cephas, um, you, you know, who just got signed, um, or or any of the Chiefs backs, not named Samaj P. Ryan, if you ask me, or any kind of mid level, mid meh, whatever the the term is now, of a of a of a non quarterback option for the rest of the the year. So if you know, if you don't mind, I'd love to hear your take on this. You know, obviously you may not view Thompson in the same ceiling level that I do. So you might see him as the mad player, but, but if you were, but in theory, if you saw him as a high win, you know, kind of a volatile guy with a high, high ceiling, low floor compared to guys who, and you look at the rest of these guys, you agree with me that they're all kind of mad philosophically. Does that fit what you're usually talking about there? Yeah. Thompson's been a guy who I've, um, kicked on and off the end of my roster over the years like we talk about like that you can kind of use the waiver wire as an extension of your team if you know like somebody else isn't gonna um so i've tried to you know like protect him in the past when i thought there might be new information and then send it back to the street when there wasn't um and so i was kind of heartbroken um when i mean uh, i mean obviously heartbroken for two of it like First and foremost, like nobody's ever rooting for injuries, whatever. Right. Um, but like recognizing that they're part of the game and that they're something that we need to to be able to account for and analyze, like um, that, like all of a sudden, Skylar Thompson is is thrust into this starting role for the foreseeable <laughs> future, possibly for the entire year, um, possibly beyond that, if Tua winds up calling it a career, which is a possibility. I I, I don't want to overrate that possibility. See, I think it's more likely he comes back than many are positing right now. Um, and you can look at the history of guys like Austin Colley, um, where there have been situations where people have been saying like, oh, he's one concussion away from like just being impaired for the rest of his life and he needs to call it a career. And, um, you know, he took some time away and he came back and it was fine. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I thought for sure that I was going to miss my chance at um, Thompson um, in this league because it's it's a pretty deep league the waiver wire is picked pretty clean and it's not super flex but um, because of the structure of the league um, quarterbacks wind up being about halfway as valuable like halfway between a one quarterback and a two quarterback league in value and I'm like oh for sure um, somebody's going to grab him on waivers and I'm going to miss out um, but he slipped through nobody even put a claim on him I was very surprised by that I'm happy pleased with it um, I also added him in our football guy staff league, which is super flex league. I've got Stafford and Mayfield as my quarterbacks, and um, it was either um, Skyler or Andy Dalton. Um, and I put in a claim on both, I, but I put Skyler ahead, um, partly because, you know, okay, Andy Dalton, he pretty much is who we think he is. You know, if he plays out this season, and, and I don't really see Bryce Young coming back in and getting that job again this year. It's, it's one of the oldest teams in the NFL. I don't think they can go back to Bryce Young this year. Um, so, you know, Dalton, yeah, maybe he's quarterback 20 the rest of the way, quarterback 24 the rest of the way. If you want a high floor, Dalton's the guy. Um, Skylar Thompson, maybe he's only in for four weeks, and then Tua returns from the IR and kicks Thompson back to the bench. Um, there's, there's a lot more variance there, but you know, quarterback 24 in Superflex is valuable, but it's not really moving the needle for you a ton. Whereas potentially Thompson could be quarterback 12 with those weapons and that head coach. And um, I always say um, in fantasy football, I'd rather have the guy who I think sucks over the guy I know sucks. And it's not, you know, like Andy Dalton doesn't suck. He's a, he's a good quarterback. Um, he's one of the best backups in the league. He's going, the Panthers are going to be fine with him but he's not really going to move the needle for your team and make your team substantially better um, this year in fantasy. Skylar Thompson probably won't, right. but he might. Right. You know, and, and, and that's the guy. I feel like it'll be a lot easier to get quarterback 26 type production off of waivers later in the year, whereas it's going to be virtually impossible to get quarterback 12 production. And if you want to get it, you're going to have to take these big swings. And if it doesn't work out, that's the nature of the game. It probably won't. But I at least want to take a swing at the pitch. We got this this nice slow pitch right over the plate. Yeah. Um, I'm at least going to take a swing at it. Um, so, I yeah, I, I um, grabbed Thompson in both leagues where he was available. Um, 
over Dalton in one, and I actually dropped Bryce Young to grab him in the other in Dynasty. Um, I don't think the book is necessarily closed on Bryce Young, but it's not looking great at this moment. And I don't really want to hold for another year or more just to find out. I'd rather have that roster spot freed up. And the thing about Thompson is if he doesn't work out, that that roster spot's going to be freed up in a hurry, which is nice. Um, I kind of feel the same way about the Chiefs running backs. Uh, Football guys did a poll on Twitter that, like, who's going to be the most valuable Chiefs running back for fantasy this year? And I said, it's probably still Isaiah Pacheco because of what I was saying about the fantasy playoffs being so much more valuable than the regular season that if Pacheco makes it back by week 12 and he's starting for you in the fantasy playoffs this year, um, and and based on the time frame I was seeing, that's reasonable. Yeah, if if he's starting for you in week 15, 16, and 17, Um, he's probably more valuable than whoever winds up taking his place. But um, if I'm going to be taking a chance on one of his backups, um, I I grabbed Steele over P. Ryan um, just because, again, eh, he's probably not anything, but I've seen Samaj P. Ryan. And he's a fine back. He deserves to be in the NFL. Like I, he's the kind of guy that like teams are very happy to have Samaj P. Ryan around when something like an Isaiah Pacheco in, injury comes up. Um, but he's he's going to be who he is. He's going to be Samaji P. Ryan. He's going to give you some low-end starting numbers if he gets the job, which eh, probably he will because he's got he's a veteran and he's easier to trust. Um, Carson Steele's probably, you know, at best going to be a change of pace guy. Maybe he gets a little bit of goal line work. But if I'm wrong about either of those backs, it's more likely I'm wrong about Steele than it is that I'm wrong about P. Ryan. Yeah, no, I think that makes sense. I mean, like, I I probably am recommending folks to to go with P Ryan because he is so good in the passing game and he's a very strong red zone runner though they want to give Steele that chance. Um Kareem Hunt is just to break the glass in case multiple people get hurt, Pacheco can't stay healthy and they have a reliable old man Frank Gore version who can basically do what they ask of them on a play without really screwing things up. Um, yeah, and, like late career LaShawn McCoy with the Bucks, or like Tatum Bell with the Broncos that one year where he was selling cell phones in the mall and then the Broncos put like eight running backs on IR and they're like, hey, I wonder what Tatum Bell's up to these days. Right, you know, it, I mean, uh, yeah. it could be that extreme. So it's like you might get something out of Hunt, but it would mean that everything's been a disaster. Um, right. You know, Keontae Ingram, I mean, they would have had him on the active roster in the first place if he's shown anything to them. And he hasn't really shown anything which is too bad because to me I thought he was a young version of he stylistically he reminded me a lot of Kareem Hunt and athletically he's got fresher legs um, and I don't know what's going on with him either he didn't get the preseason opportunities um, and so they don't really know what they have in him because that does happen they may look at him and say he's more of a special teamer that we got off of the end of a, the Cardinals roster and you know doesn't really make time with that because that happens a lot. Um, or they did see enough and go, we just don't think he's dedicated on the level to for us to feel good about trusting him in our lineups. And if, and that can happen with a guy who's a fi- who was a five star back at Texas who got usurped by Bijan Robinson due to injury and play and and had to fight his way back in. But maybe people thought he had that five star attitude of like he was privileged on some level because that that does happen a lot from what i from from what i have talked to recruiters and and scouts that there can be concerns about that where a lot of these guys who don't make it it's because they already think that they made it um you know at the college level they don't realize they got to go another level up so yeah it's also important to note too that that rookies um, and like young unproven players they're the only players in fantasy football who average more points per game over the second half of the season than the first um, and that's just the trust factor it takes a while to earn that trust but i think you know if p ryan versus Steele winds up being a split it'll probably skew p ryan's way at first but by the time the fantasy playoffs roll around it might have flipped and and since those are the more valuable games like those are the ones that i really want to optimize and, and target for like i think Good i can point. make the playoffs without either of them yeah. um but so i want the guy who maybe has a shot of getting hot around that time i also want to say with skylar thompson there's this kind of tendency to fantasy it's kind of funny where um we have like no object permanence it's like a player doesn't exist unless we're paying attention to him um and i remember 
in 2014, 2015, like the top three tight ends in the draft were uh, Rob Gronkowski, Jimmy Graham, and uh, Julius Thomas. And Rob Gronkowski kept falling because people are like, oh, well, he's the most injury prone of the three. And I'm like, if you look at the history, like Julius Thomas and Jimmy Graham had tons of injuries. They just happened before we know, knew who they were, so they don't count, right? If we're not paying attention to Julius Thomas because he's on the end of the Broncos roster, none of those injuries count. They never happen. Um, and I think Skylar Thompson's is kind of the same way where like when we were paying attention to him, he struggled. Granted, he was a seventh round rookie you know, thrust into the, who, who hadn't been prepared as a starter. Like, of course he struggled, yeah. but the last time we saw him, he struggled. And then we haven't seen anything from him in the two years since. So nothing that he's done in the last two years happened. Yeah. But when you're looking at these late round guys who do wind up making it, one of the biggest indicators you'll find is that they're sticking on a roster year after year after year. Because typically what happens is a seventh rounder or an undrafted player, they'll make it their rookie year. And then the next year, they bring in somebody else to replace them, and that player's gone. It, it's not they, – they don't last for very long. There are multiple quarterbacks who've done that um, during that draft class or even in later draft classes after Thompson that we could list who have fit that, that mark. That's the norm. I mean, at 90% of guys, if you're you know, a late rounder um, – it's not just that that you're not playing well it's that you're out of the league and and the exceptions um that there tends to be a lot of signal there i mean you look at like uh tony romo undrafted free agent he managed to stick on the cowboys for three years before he finally got his shot and and after one year like what are the odds this undrafted guy ever does anything they're basically nothing after two years you know getting more interesting after three years you're like you know he has zero draft capital backing him up but the team believes him in him enough that they're bringing him back year after year after year and he's moving up the depth chart from third to second um and now he's in first guys like that have a have a heightened success rate um guys like kurt warner where he's with the team for a couple of years before he finally gets his shot the fact that that he was there that it gives him, you know, there's, there's more um, um, credibility to it. You know, I was looking at like Tyson Bajant with the bears. He came in and played pretty well as a seventh round rookie. And, and like, teams, and teams actually inquired about him in the absolutely. off season. Right. The fact that he played well as a rookie, that doesn't move the needle for me at all. The fact that he's the backup quarterback in year two, that means a lot because the bears absolutely could have brought somebody in. That's the, the one constant in the league is competition. You know, anybody can rise to the top in the short term through some confluence of factors, through luck, through flukes. You know, TJ Yates wound up starting a playoff game just because things broke his way. It takes genuine talent to, to stick around for the long haul after that and, and to take on challengers year after year after year and to hold them off because everybody's hungry for your spot and you have yeah. to fight for it every year. So again, I don't think Skylar Thompson's going to be anything. Uh, most likely, he's not going to look significantly better than he did two years ago. Um, but there's enough there that has me interested. Yeah. And and I think that that's, you know, I think that's a, an appropriate conservative point of view with it. You know, as someone who scouted him and knowing, you know, um, you know, knowing one of the guys who grew up practically in the 49ers dynasty era of Montana and young in the 49ers organization because his dad was part of the scouting group that was there and he then became a scout. After I saw a few years ago that Skylar Thompson was going to be my top graded quarterback on that, you know, in that class of that was pretty dreadful. Um, Turned out, you know, with Malik Willis and Ritter and, and, uh, you know, the kid from the state who was with the Steelers and the Eagles now. I can't remember his name right off the bat. Um, the Pitt kid, um, you know, Pickett. Part, yeah, Pickett and Strong, you know. I had I, I put an asterisk next to his name because I was like, look, I know he's not going to... I just wanted to pay attention, people to understand. I know this This is not someone you need to go after right now. But understand that he he had a very high grade from me. And I was telling people about it. It was funny because, you know, I talked to, to Chad Ryder at NFL.com, a good friend of mine, and he's like, yeah, I don't know, man. I don't know. That one might be a miss. And... 
because I watched him and eh, I'm just not sure, you know, really. And I talked to Russ Landy about it and I said, go watch him, you know, and he watched a few weeks and, and Russ is the same guy who also had like Mark Bolger and Tom Brady very high um, as examples of guys who, you know, by year two, they were, you know, emerged from low round draft status. And uh, he was like, yeah, I get it. Like, I see where you're coming from, you know? And he said, I had talked to, and it was the scout that, I can't remember his name, um, who, who, oh, Dave Rosano. Uh, that's who it was, Dave Rosano. Um, and he said, Dave had a high grade on him too. Like, Dave, Dave really likes him. And I, and I, you know, kind of asked around with some other scouts that I can't men- mention who were in the league. And and they were like, yeah, there's there's some guys who actually have like a, a second round, third round grade on this guy, um, and 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 really like him more than most. And and it was funny because like the fact I've had him on, I think any league that I've had at least forty roster spots, he's been he's been on my team and he hasn't left it. It was I think with the exception of one. Um, so for that reason is that you know he survived the competition with Mike White it was essentially a slight tie and they gave it to to White and they kept him on the roster and I thought wow that's a that's a notable thing that tells you that they're seeing improvement they're seeing progress with this guy on some level um and so so yeah I I think your words are sobering in a way that people need to hear um but I would also say from the, the ability standpoint, um, I'm excited to see if if he can show the level of improvement to play the game at the level that I saw flashes of at Kansas State. Um, and if he does, he will surprise. So, but it's yeah. a, you know, so yeah. You mentioned uh, Mark Bulger. He's another guy who late round pick, sixth round pick, stuck on for like three years um, and there was signal there. Or like Jake DeLome, was an undrafted guy yeah. stuck in the league for like three, four years. Finally got his shot. Case yeah, it, Keenum, it's you know. Yep, yep. You know, if it just if you're not in the lineup, people think you don't exist. But just the fact that you're making a team is is such a testament to um, how the NFL yeah. sees you. Um, and also, you mentioned Malik Will- Willis. I want to give a shout out to to Malik Willis. Like, good for him. Yes. Um, there was this great question about like you know. Do you have a grudge against the Titans, whatever? And he's like, no, man, they paid me every single week. I was there, right? They gave me my shot. Um, they they brought in and they did the, they did absolutely right by me. I have nothing but the best feelings for them. I wish them, you know, nothing but the best, which um, somebody on my timeline joked that like, this is like such a great and wholesome attitude. And it's also why Malik Willis will never be great because like, you ask that about Tom Brady and Tom Brady would be like, Oh yeah, those idiots. They had no idea what they had. I'm going to spend the next 40 years of my life making sure they regret this every single waking hour or like, like Aaron Rodgers, like the all time great quarterbacks or Michael Jordan, you know, back. Right. Right. There's Hall that of little Fame bit of speech. psychopath to him. Yeah. Like you've got to be a little bit unhinged to achieve that level of greatness. And, and Malik Willis is such a nice, wholesome, well-adjusted dude that he's i i'm like wow i really like him as a person yeah. but i'm moving him down my fantasy football <laughs> rankings too, after that answer too funny and i laugh because well speaking of which you know i saw you know if we're going to talk about folks editorializing stuff there's so much editorializing about the cj stroud caleb williams interaction at the end of the game and people need you know let me tell you something about caleb williams that i do know and it was something that his coach will hewlett detailed um, during a podcast in May, and if you didn't catch it, you can you can cat you can scroll down and find it, you know, at your provider, um, your platform. But he talked about. I said, so what's something that people don't know about Caleb? And he said, you know, I think that they see him as this standoffish superstar who's all me, 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 and you know, it's it's all about getting attention and things like that. And he's a flashy player, so they assume that he's a that he's a bit of a diva he said you know i have three sons and they're all quarterbacks and one of them is you know playing at usf right now um it's his freshman year i think at usf and he said that uh he said you know he would come out to practices just to 
to hang out and help out sometimes or just to visit and he was there and you know there's pros there um there's other pros there at various levels whether it's cfl pros nfl pros like brock purdy um you know other prospects and they'll be around too working with his partner tom gormley and he said you know at the end of a uh, of a long session we had with caleb he said my son was out there throwing balls and he came out there and walked over to caleb you know no one was around no cameras were around you know none of that and he just said hey you know um do you mind if i give you some give you some advice about some things and and the kid and my son was like yeah of course not you know what you know and he literally spent he spent an hour with my son just you know nobody around just doing you know trying to be helpful with all that so i just caution people that like after a ball game when you've lost and you've had the shit beaten out of you and your offensive line can't seem to track a, a stunt or a twist um and you still kept it in the game um that maybe you and you might be competitive enough to think that one day you're going to be better than cj stroud or as good as him you know in terms of like your profile and you know you got to have that competitive spark in you you may not feel like talking to anybody you, you know you just you're in that moment and you're a rookie and sometimes you forget about the magnifying glass that's in front of you so i i would take it easy on people when they get caught in those moments like that because you, you know i i laugh and i hear what people were saying about it and i go you don't know what the fuck you're talking about like you don't really know and this is what scouts get in trouble with if so i'm trying to when if i'm going to translate this to scouting i've heard over and over again from veteran people in the league they're like when they give scouts the opportunity to editorialize information um it usually goes wrong because again they look at something like this and they actually end up writing about it and and making these vast judgments and the and they'll look at things and go oh he's a party or he's a diva he's that he's not going to get along with his teammates he's going to be and it turns out that it's not remotely anything like that and they end up uh, unbelievably wrong because they don't know how to do the research or they don't know how to take the information in the research and really parse it out in a manner that's actually actionable and meaningful and they often get the whole thing wrong um, so if scouts can't do it who are assigned to actually try and make these character designations um, if they don't do it well and the ones that do usually say let's get some industrial psychologists onto the team and or people with deep law enforcement backgrounds so that we can parse this information out um, effectively or at least scouts with experience that we can rely on with that who've consulted these types of sources and do that odds are most of you on x or so or threads or anywhere else you know you're not going to know either you know so just keep that in mind yeah i mean my modest proposal is like maybe let's just stop policing emotional reactions to right. emotional situations like yeah. I, I like i remember cam newton everybody's like oh he's smiling on the sideline how like what a travesty like his team is down by eight and he's actually happy you know like he's he's he told a joke when his team yeah. is down by 10 um and it's like you know joe montana went into the game uh and like huddled up and he's like hey is that john candy you right. know like i think the test is do his teammates respond to him because there's different styles and and at the end of the day if your teammates respond it's going to work if your teammates aren't responding it's not going to work um and and a lot of different styles can work uh we saw cam newton his style of leadership worked fine in the nfl uh caleb williams his his teammates seem to respond to him really well from everything we've seen you know they seem to be buying in um so like to me that's all i care about yeah exactly well we appreciate that you guys care about this podcast and uh thank you for tuning in as always you can check out adam at adam harstead on x of course you can go to football guys and see all the fine content that he's putting out um find me at matt waldman also matt waldman's rsp film room i put out something recently on the uh, jaguars receivers also something recently on I'm trying to remember who I worked on this week that I did for the gut check. Oh, Quentin Johnston and why I see some improvement out of him. 
um, and what that may mean for his fantasy um, skills. Um, I've been under the weather for the past week, so I'm a little out of it if you guys haven't been able to tell. So, um, so you know, we're going to cut this short and hopefully uh, get a little bit of energy back and, and keep it moving. Take care.